She regularly reviews crime fiction for the Globe and Mail. Please welcome Margaret Cannon. Hi, can you hear me? I, 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 all machines loathe me, so I'm... It's a great pleasure and privilege to be here tonight with so many readers. I love readers, all of you. Uh, and it's great to be introducing uh, a Canadian writer who has become a much-loved and quite a spectacular success. It's true she's on the bestseller list this week, but she's not just on the bestseller list. This week, Louise Penny is number one on the New York Times bestseller list. That's... And that's a list that includes James Patterson uh, uh, and uh, Margaret Atwood. So that's pretty good. Uh, she's also number five on the ebook and hardcover bestseller list. So this is a feat for uh, any of you who write or who uh, uh, know writers know that this is an accomplishment that very, very few people get. And it's, dis and it's all due to uh, her talent, uh, a gift, and the fact that people like you really like to read the books she writes. And so without further ado, let's welcome Louise Penny and hear all about Gamash and Three Pines. Now, oh, wait a minute. Oh, yes. Yeah, turn, okay. turn yourself on, Louise. <laughs> I will. That's... <laughs> what, in fact, before we start, would you mind if I take a photograph of all these beautiful people? Everybody smile. This is, this is for my Christmas card. <laughs> actually, this is for the publisher because I think he thinks that I don't actually show up to these things. <laughs> that I do, and even worse, I, I exaggerate how many people come because he can't believe it. So let me, I'm going to stand over here, and if any of you have my book, my book, I don't want to see anyone else's book held up, <laughs> that would be even better. Okay. All right. Oh, my God. All right, here goes. Thank you. And it's also going on Facebook, so if any of you happen to be in the witness protection program, <laughs> or here with someone else, you should, shouldn't be. It's, well, actually, I don't care. There. We'll turn it off. <laughs> All right, I'm ready. You're ready. Well, I think everybody wants to know, first of all, first and foremost, where is Three Pines? We all want Three Pines. Every now and then, Michael, Michael is here. Can I introduce my husband, who is the inspiration for Gamash? Michael, stand up. <laughs> Woo! Every now and then, I get an email from, from people. Uh, like a lot of people, thankfully, are coming to Quebec, and they want to see some of the uh, uh, locations that have inspired scenes. But a lot of people want to know, where is Three Pines? And, and I've, I've had emails from people saying, you know, we live in Copenhagen and we're, we're, we have our tickets and we'd like to book into the bistro or to the b and uh -oh. So I think, turn to Michael and say, well, one of us has to be Gavri and one of us has to be Olivier. <laughs> you get to choose. <laughs> we're putting people up from Copenhagen, honey. <laughs> but you know, Three Pines doesn't exist. Three Pines is... Um, uh, my ideal village, the place I created because um, it was a kind of a difficult time in the world. It was around 2001. It was a difficult, a, a, a stressful time in my own life. And I don't know about you, but I, every now and then I just feel the need for a safe place, whether it's a physical place or a place I go to in my head. And I, when I was creating these books, I thought, that's what I want. I want a safe place, a place I will enjoy visiting, because essentially that's what I do when, I'm, when I write. I go into Three Pines. But it's, it's inspired by a lot of towns in the townships. If any of you know the townships, there's a lot of villages that are, at least in, in the sensibility, 
they're like that, not physically necessarily. Townships towns tend not to have the village green that's kind of a little bit more English, a little bit more New England, um, which I did that on purpose as well. But, you know, even more than that, and I can appreciate people who uh, already have their ticket to come and they want to stay in Three Pines, don't really want to hear this, but I think of Three Pines as a state of mind. I genuinely, I genuinely do. I think of Three Pines as the place I live in when I choose to be kind. When I, I have that fork in the road and I could make the cutting remark, I could be cynical, I could be even cruel, often with a smile, or I can be kind. I can find fault or I can find something nice to say. And when I find something nice to say, I live in Three Pines. Yeah, uh, it, well, it's, it is a wonderful place to go to. I think, the re I think one of the things I love reading about Three Pines is that it's a place where I can go and people are kind. Mm -hmm. And even though, let's face it, bodies drop. Yes. But, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, you, you know a, a nice, kind, beautiful now town you're where finding people fault. actually die. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least you don't, you don't knock them off as well as uh, Miss Marple used to in St. Mary Mead. I mean, my God. <laughs> She actually ever did it herself. No, she ever did it herself. <laughs> but I, I'm sure that uh, uh, they used to, uh, you know, practically end up in her front lawn. Yeah, you don't want to be one of the uh, one of the maids, scullery maids. No, no, in, you in don't want to be a scullery maid. maid. Um, but the uh, uh, the the place itself has become really, I think, for a lot of readers, it's become an essential part of the uh, uh, the books. I mean, I find a lot of the. Uh, uh, advertisements now are no longer saying it's a gamache novel, they're saying it's a Three Pines novel. Like the place has become very integral and in this book particularly I think the place itself yes. is a character in this you're, book you're and more, right. more, more so than any of the others. No, you're quite right. But uh, when I started out I wanted a very, very uh, real sense of place. I knew that I wanted the place to be one of the main um, characters in the books. And I wanted there to be, Emily Dickinson talks about novels being frigates that can take us to places we can't normally go. So I really wanted people, when they picked up any of my novels, whether they live in Estonia or Arizona or Vancouver, and they pick it up, that there be no doubt that this is a ticket of passage to Canada and specifically to Quebec. But even more than that, it's also she meant it's a, a we get to voyage inside ourselves to places that we couldn't normally get to access ourselves. But yes, Three Pines is definitely a character in the books. And it's, it was important to me. The first four books were meant to be, and, and are, in fact, set in different seasons for that reason. The first book in the fall, second book in the winter, and so on. And I wanted my books to also be, ideally what I was trying to do was drop that fourth wall so that when people are reading a book, the books, you're not watching Gamache, you're not watching Olivier or Ruth or anything, you're, you're accompanying them. And the best way to do that is to make the books sensuous, not, not sexual. I don't want them turning themselves on. <laughs> um, but I, I, I want to, to engage all the senses so that you, you can smell the wood smoke. You can taste the, the food that they're, the croissant. You can feel the chill in the air. Um, and that brings alive a sense of place, too. It really, when I was sending around the book, Still Life, nobody wanted it. It got turned down by more than 50 agents, publishers, everybody. Nobody wanted it. Nobody wanted it. If I could have sent it into outer space, it would have been an intergalactic failure. <laughs> And what, one of the things I kept hearing was that nobody will be interested in a mystery set in Canada. That's, that, yes. This, is, I, this is chronic. I mean, you know, it's, it's always, you know, why don't you set it in Milwaukee? And people will love it. There. <laughs> yes, they'll gobble it up. <laughs> can hardly wait. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I mean, you, there, there, it's an article of publishing faith, or has been for many years. You can't set a book in Canada. That's right. Um, uh, and I, th I thought, well, then that's just too bad it won't be published, because this has to be set in Canada. It has to be. These books are lovely. I am so happy to be Canadian, so proud of it. And you are, too. 
Well, and, and it is a distinctively Canadian, but these, these are distinctively Canadian. They're not just uh, Canada's, uh, Montreal sort of passing itself off as French-speaking New York. Uh, uh, you know, I mean, it's, it, there really is a, a sense of Canadianness about them. Double which, doubles. I would get, I got emails from my, my editors in New York and in London, especially early on. Now I think they can figure it out, but they say, well, they know what a double double is because that's fairly obvious, but they'll say things like, now, what's a toque? <laughs> toque? Now, did you know that a toque is, is Canadian? Only Canadian? Well, you should have told me. <laughs> I had no idea. I had them wearing toques, and, and then they say, what's a toque? Well, well, first of all, all right, so you don't know what a toque is. Clearly, situationally, can you not figure it out? <laughs> you know, it's cold. They're putting something on their heads. It's, it's, it's gravy. What do you think it is? <laughs> which, which was another question. What's poutine? Uh, <laughs> now that, even when I told them what poutine was, they didn't believe me. <laughs> that, well, that, that can't be right. <laughs> but it's interesting when you say 50, 50 publishers, and I just turned it down at least. At least, at least internationally. <laughs> Why do I keep saying that like it's a good thing? <laughs> well, you know what it was? It was the worst of it was was the silence. It's not like they even turned it down. There was nothing. I would send it out, and this was before they were taking electronic submissions, so you'd, you'd do self-addressed stamped envelopes, S-A-S-E's, and you'd send out the a synopsis, the first three chapters, and the self-addressed stamped envelope. Send, I remember being in the, the little village um, post office and just kind of blessing it. All right, good luck, good luck. <laughs> And hearing nothing, and going, going. Michael knows he would walk with me from the house to the post office to the to the mailbox at the end of the our our driveway. <laughs> nothing. That was. And, but once I actually got it came a self-addressed envelope came back, and it was my own cover letter with no written across it. <laughs> that was the only response I got. But it was kind of exciting because it was the, their handwriting of of a New York agent. It was actually, he had misspelled yes, but he had actually written it. It was heartbreaking. It was heartbreaking. And I'd actually just about given up and was going to put it in a shoebox and shove it under the bed and let, you know, the, the next generation do whatever, burn it. And I had entered um, a contest by the Crime Writers Association Great Britain. And they had this best unpublished first novel contest. And it was, it's such a generous thing to create. And that is it to give the next generation a, a, the step up that they themselves didn't have. And there's not very many people give out others benefits that they themselves didn't have. And, and they recognized it. And they, they're offering it. And they, it's something that they continue to do. So I had entered that. And... Um, I had forgotten. I thought the deadline had passed. So I really thought, I thought all of my options had been exhausted and this really must be a big pile of something soft and smelly. <laughs> and then I got this email saying I'd been shortlisted. I'd been short, out of 800 entries worldwide, still life had been shortlisted. And I fell on my knees and I must have shrieked because Michael and the dog both showed up. <laughs> when I regained consciousness, there they were. And that was that was the beginning of it. That's that, I, I had forgotten that it was shortlisted on their uh, mm -hmm. on their best unpublished first, mm -hmm. because that's really it's true. This really does, and I I suspect that the reason why it went to it it was the British crime writers who liked it, was because there are two things that uh, the American, that particularly the American mystery writers, uh, you know, everyone right now is plugged into uh, gore. We want serial killers. We want, uh, uh, and there's a lot of charm in uh, uh, in Three Pines and with all the characters. And uh, people will say to me, "Oh well, you know, charm. You know, nobody wants to read about charm anymore." Well, please, folks, you're all here tonight. Yeah, like nobody's interested in a crime novel uh, set in Canada. And, and people are still. Uh, well, I noticed that they, you know, that a number of other uh, a number of other uh, uh, authors who don't, you know, who continue to write. 
I don't like using the word old-fashioned, but who write uh, from a different perspective mm -hmm. um, are still doing very, very well. And we still have um, a real movement. The other thing I like about your, uh, your writers is that there is a certain elan, a kind of Frenchness about them. And uh, someone asked me, uh, actually, I, I, I'd written a review, and I'd used the first names, Ruth, Myrna, Clara, <laughs> uh, Gabri, Olivia. And I think it was one of my editors at the Globe called back and said, no, no, you can't do this. Nobody knows who these people are. I said, I said these people know who the, you know, the people who are reading this review know all of these people. They don't know who you are. And they don't know who you, are. <laughs> um, um, you know, because they have become old friends. I mean, I, I, I look, what's Ruth doing now? <laughs> no, nothing. She's up to no good. She's always up to She'd no good. She'd be sitting in that, that, the back there with all those people with the glasses of red wine. <laughs> I'm wearing my, my, my pointy toe uh, old lady shoes from Germany that I thought Ruth would like. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, you know, these are the kind of thing that I thought Ruth would, Ruth would feel right at home with. And, uh, uh, but even the dog. I mean, I look forward to seeing what's going to happen with Henri next. Uh, and he has a big role in this one. He gets, he gets a lot of uh, space in this book. Let's talk about this book. I, now, as you know, I'm giving away nothing. Don't even ask later on. You're not going to find out anything. Except that uh, Except one of the things that I really like about this book is that Louise has taken some honest-to-God Canadian history and fictionalized it. And I think Canadian history is fascinating. Oh, yes. Yeah, so no one else does, but I do. <laughs> and uh, I'm always wondering why writers don't do more with it. Uh, and there have been a couple of, of crime writers, I might add, who have done some very interesting things with Canadian history. And this one uh, uh, borrows on uh, the wonderful chapter in Ontario history, but it's been moved to Quebec, with the Dion Quintuplets. Now, how did you get there? I, I'd been watching some of the, um, I don't, don't actually watch it, to be, to be fair, I really don't, the, the reality shows, but the, the proliferation of them, I guess, the, um, like the Honey Boo Boo and, and John and Kate plus eight, and it, I, I just was feeling really awful about what this might mean for these children. And, you know, God willing, they will thrive and everything will be fine. But it reminded me a little bit of what happened with the Dion Quint. Terrible story. Oh, and and but what what I and it, and I love taking episodes in Canadian history and using them as a jumping off point to examine a bunch of other things, but also to show the world that we have a rich history. Um, and the Dion Quint is a is a wonderful and again it's an allegory. It's a, it's a look at the duality because the books are about many things. Probably the least among them is death, but. One of the things that they're about is duality, the, the beautiful village and the violation, the, the gap between what we, what we say and what we really think, between the public veneer and our, our inner emotions. And in this case, the, the Dion Quints and, and the fictionalized Wallet Quints were a perfect, in my opinion, vehicle for that duality and that the outside, to the outside world, they, it looked like an ideal life. Here were these five children born in to, to terrible poverty in the middle of the Depression, in the middle of nowhere, scooped up. They were given the best clothes, the best food, all the dolls, everything. They were idealized. They were adored. They had everything except privacy. What happens to human beings who have no privacy, no inner life, no secret garden all to themselves? And so I wanted to see what happens Oh, take that and spread it over time and, and look at my fictionalized, well, at Quint, Quints. Now, at the end of the book, I do talk about the Dion Quints, but I, I have to make it clear, too, that I really, beyond what I already knew, just as a Canadian growing up and of a certain age, of the Dion Quints, I had no desire to do to them, again, what had already been done over and over. So it, it, I really took the idea and then made it my own. I didn't do any research on what really happened to the, to the Dion's. But it's but it, it gives you it was a great it's a great jumping off point. I mean, you know, and the and the question arises immediately at the beginning of the book. I mean, what you know, where did the what happened to these people? 
Uh, they've lived this very private life for the last few years. And then the question, which I will not answer, is is she or is she not the last of the, 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 uh, the, last of the quintuplets? <coughs> Uh, there's a, a, a it's it's a wonderful jumping off place, but also when we talk about the duality, in this book, unlike some of the others, uh, we have Gamache himself facing a real crisis, a personal, uh, mm -hmm. uh, an enormous personal crisis, and he's literally in some ways fleeing to Three Pines. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's going there to salvage himself. Yeah. Uh, uh, and of course, he's without his. Uh, well, we won't say too much. Well, we I'm, won't sorry. Say anymore. I'm sorry. I'm <laughs> sorry. That's all in the first. That's all. That's all the first chapter. I want you to know, really, how brave I am because these shoes are serious, and you don't want to <laughs> <laughs> interrupting Margaret Cannon a swift kick, and that could be the end of the series. <laughs> oh no, it'll go on way beyond me. <laughs> they're pointy. They're, but it, I think it, they're steel-toed. <laughs> steel but I, I did find uh, 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 the. Um, um, I, I found this book really. This one spoke to me. The others are all good, but this one I think is the best. I really do believe this is thank the you. best of the lot. Thank you. I hope. Thank you. And uh, one of the things that you talked about uh, earlier that I think people would be interested in is the fact that those of us who have read the series from beginning to now uh, have watched it evolve. Um, you know, Still Life was a good book, but the books have gotten better. Every book has been Thank a you. little better than Thank the last. You. Uh, the characters be, have, have more depth, the, uh, uh, the, the, the place becomes more fixed. Uh, so it's obvious that, you're, that you yourself are changing as you work these books out. Um, I, I think so, certainly as a writer. I mean, I hope that I'm becoming a better and better writer and more confident, less fearful. I realize how, what a role fear has played in my life, all my life, and, and, and not a good role. <laughs> and it's quite, it can be quite paralyzing. Um, and I, it was terrifying writing the second book because it, it took me 45 years to write the first book. <laughs> and then my agent called, and the miracle had occurred, and, and she had sold still life. And I honestly, because I didn't know really how publishing worked, so I thought, well, She'll sell, sell the first book, Still Life. It will make me a million dollars. <laughs> They'll send me on tour in the private jet, of course. And then we'll see what happens after that. Well, she calls up and she says, and she's got a British accent, well, because she lives in London, so she would. But, you know, <laughs> and I know it's just me, and I don't know what it is about, about me, but every time I hear someone speaking with a British accent, there is a kind of an implied you idiot. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, and sometimes not with Teresa, not simply implied. <laughs> but she called up and she said, I so sold. so Canadian. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. She said, I've sold three books. And I said, oh my God, Teresa, that's fantastic. <laughs> Mine and, and who else's? <laughs> They're all three of them are yours, and I, I swear, I almost had a fit because I, I thought writing still life. It really was the only thing I had wanted to do was write a book from the age of eight, and I was well into my late forty, so really forty years. Um, there seemed something magical about it, and I had taken my time. I had, and I don't really quite know how I did it, was the thing, and now. I needed to write another book in a year. <laughs> Thank you. And, and I'd already spent the advance on the sandwich. So. <laughs> I'd, I'd eaten the advance. <laughs> so the, the second book was terrifying to write. And, I was, and because I'd also I've suffered, before I'd written Still Life, I'd suffered from writer's block, again, fear. So I, I, didn't, I didn't want that to happen again, because I'd been finally handed everything I have ever wanted. Everything. I was living in the country of the man I loved, doing what I love. I was writing these, these books about these people that I really care about. I was, I was given a writing career, and I was about to lose it because I was afraid I couldn't do it. And I wanted the second book to be at least as good or better than the next. And I was writing from a place of great terror and confusion. And, and I went to a therapist, and, and 
I explained all this, and she said, well, the wrong person is writing the book, which is not initially that helpful. <laughs> <laughs> so I asked her what she meant by that. <laughs> and she said, your critic is writing the book. You need to thank your critic. You need to bless your critic. You need to show the critic the door. You don't lock it because you're going to need her later. <laughs> and your, your creative soul, your creative spirit needs to write the first draft. And if you spend five pages writing about a pair of shoes, do it. Who cares? It's not going to end up in the final draft. Just write. Write with joy. Write with gratitude. Write with awareness of how lucky you are. Pour everything into that first draft, and then invite the critic in, and let the critic shape. Because somewhere in there, if you write with joy, and gratitude, and creativity, and bravery, somewhere in there will be the story that you want to tell. Now, at the, about the same time, Teresa called from England. I, now, I'm afraid she sold even more books, right? <laughs> she said, so how's it going, Louise? I'm saying, oh, I'm having, I'm having a difficult time, Teresa. And she said, oh, for God's sake, it's not war and peace you're writing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. I, I always, I see her now. By then, I saw her as like this, this with a vat of martinis and a cigar. And she's <laughs> brushing ash off her bosom. <laughs> so when she sobered up the next day, she called back. <laughs> and she said, all right, now here's the thing, Louise. The thing is that most authors can write a thousand words a day. Most books are about 90,000 words, 100,000. Ergo, I want to see the manuscript in three months. Now, do you know what she did, though, in that, in that moment? You know, I, I found in my life, I don't know about yours, but, but moments of grace and frying pans in the face look a lot alike. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what she had given me, was that both at the same time. Because what I needed was to understand it's not magic. There might be inspiration. There might be, you know, gift of God. But it is, there is a structure. If I can sit down, because I didn't realize that. I had taken, I had written still life in, in cow fields while Michael was sketching and following him around and writing him all over the place on laptops. And I just took my time. This time I couldn't do that. She gave me the structure. Give a word count. It doesn't have to be a thousand words. It could be 500, it could be 200. I get to choose. But if you do that every day, eventually you will end up where you need to be. Now at the same time, just after that, I also read the diaries of uh, Terry Fox. I don't know if you had a chance to read that. Wonderful. He kept diaries. Douglas Couplin put it together in a book about, I don't know, eight years ago it must have been, because uh, I read it about this time. And in it, Terry Fox talked about running across the country. Nobody knew better than him what the goal was. But he said he didn't wake up every morning to run across the country. He didn't wake up every morning to run to Victoria. All he wanted to do was run to the next corner. And then he ran to the next corner. And he ran to the next corner. And this fed into exactly what Teresa said. And that, I realized, that's all I needed to do. Every day, I need to run to the next corner. And eventually, I will get to the end. And then I invite the critic in. And she does her work. And that there really is a process. And if you're lucky, part of that process is also inspiration. Well, I have to say that uh, uh, what you've described is, I hope, if there are any writers out there tonight, I hope you're taking notes. Because I live in a world where book two is often a dog. <laughs> I mean, really, you, you get a debut that's absolutely phenomenal, and the second book comes out, and you think, is this the same writer? And I think that, that uh, a lot of it has to do, yes, the publisher. The, the, in, in all mysteries, the idea is the second book's got to come hard on the heels of the first. That's, that's the phrase. And they want it within a year. And uh, uh, you find a lot of writers who could be up there who are, in fact, down here because they're cranking. They're trying to write, that. They're trying to write those three books in, in, uh, uh, in nine months, and they, and, and they are letting the critic write them. That's right. It's, they're writing from fear, and they're writing, I think, often 
for, um, for the publisher's approval, for even for the, for the market. You can't, I guess some people can. I can't write for the market because it wouldn't be from my heart. I have to write from my heart and hope that the market comes along. But you know, I have to tell you, if, if at some stage you, have, you decide, well, it's run its course, well, I'm going to still write because I love these characters. I love their company. And you know, you're invited along for the ride, and it's a big tent, and I love your company. But, but it, you, know, I, I'm, you don't have to come. It's OK. Well, I, you know, you're all here tonight uh, because you are the market. And the thing that's fascinating to me always, the question I get asked practically every month, I've got some publisher, a writer, an agent, taking me out to lunch and saying, tell us, Margaret, what's the next big thing? And my response is inevitably, who knows? Well, I think you could say gamash. <laughs> I said, I said Gamash eight years ago, and everybody said, he's charming, he can't be. Um, you know, I hated the Da Vinci Code. I hated the Da Vinci Code. I'm still, my, uh, you know, uh, uh, the globe is still uh, uh, griping about that one. Uh, but you can't, you really, it, particularly with these kinds of books, you cannot predict. No, you can't. Uh, this does not, still life, and this, the whole conform. series. It doesn't conform. It doesn't conform, and, and I think that's perhaps book. one of the, one of the reasons you've come to it, because it's, it's not cookie cutter. It doesn't conform. Uh, and, and, it's come to, uh, uh, and it comes by, by the best of all possible ways, which is people reading it and talking about it and telling their friends. Mm -hmm. That is how a uh, so-called over the transom book happens. Um, I was with a group of writers just recently, uh, and we were talking about, among others, this book and uh, uh, a book called Gone Girl by a woman named Gillian Flynn. That's, take, that's, that's taken everybody by, by, by storm. And somebody said to me, well, well, you know, Margaret, you reviewed Gone Girl and loved it. I said, yeah, I loved it. And it is the antithesis of this book. It is full of people who are hateful and unpleasant, and it's irresistible. Um, well, do you know, this is, that's a great, you know, good writing is good writing. Good writing is good writing. Yeah, and they're, they're yes, exactly. Exactly. I've heard fantastic things about Gone it's, Girl. But, it's, it, but it, is, it is absolutely the antithesis of your book. Thank and God. Yet, it's a, it, yeah. So, I'm sorry, but the, you know, there's just, there's just, that's the beauty of reading, isn't it? That we don't just read one book read over one book. and over. It's, we have, we have we're small C Catholic in our tastes. And, and you know, I, I hope publishers understand that. that no, they don't. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, they always think that, you know, that, you know, three more of these will go, and they'll find three writers who can't write this. <laughs> And he'll do, he'll do palette imitations. I get, you know, we, we get so many imitations of good writing. I am really lucky with my editors and publishers in um, New York at St. Martin's Press Minotaur. Not once have they said to me, you know, you have to up the body count. <laughs> or you have to take add a some sex. Add some sex. Yeah, add Even some though sex. it doesn't fit, put it in there. Yeah, that not, never once have they ever ever done that, and I'm, I'm really grateful. They've never, never tried to shape it. They've just said, do what, what it is you want to do. And, um, well now, but, and you want to do unusual things. Uh, we were talking about this just before we came in, and uh, uh, while people have not yet been able to find Three Pines, and you haven't done a cookbook or a, uh, <laughs> uh, a, a travelogue, but you have been to London, and I understand, have Gamache made us a, a personal scent? Yes, we have an eau de gamache. <laughs> Michael and I love going to London, and, and there's a wonderful um, um, perfumer there called Floris. Is, are you at all familiar with Floris? Very, very old perfumer, and they still have uh, a, a, a perfumer, a person who actually does the concoctions and the colognes and the, uh, puts them together, creates them. And so I gave her a couple of the Gamache books in which, because Gamache is described as having this cologne that is sandalwood and a hint of rose and whatnot, and, uh, and she read it, and then she kept, started sending me samples <laughs> through the mail. So I'd spray them on Michael and say, you know, go into the village, honey, see what people... <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> Report back. <laughs> And, uh, but if, and then we were visiting in the spring and summer, and I went back. And this place is really cool. If you're ever in London, you have to see it. It's on German Street. It's called Floris. 
And it's, it's, like, it's a complete throwback. It's, it's like something out of Harry Potter. It's all, all vials and, and things that are bubbling away. <laughs> and it's just really interesting. Not a computer or, or a cell phone in sight. And, and she started brewing this, this thing. And, and we were there, Michael and I were there for about an hour and a half. After a while, though, it gets a little bit intoxicating. Because, you, you know, you can't, it all smells the same after a while. Um, but we tried to make intelligent comments as she was brewing. And eventually she hit it. She hit it. And when she got it, she got it bang on. I'm so thrilling about that. So thrilled about that. But you know, the other thing, though, is that we do have, it's nothing to do with me, actually, although I approved it. There is a, a tour of Quebec City based on Bury Your Dead. So oh, good. If anyone is planning to go, because all the all the places he goes to, all the restaurants, all the bars, all the places he stands and, and considers exist. And you don't have to go in the winter. <laughs> um, so that, that was, it's, it's called Bury Your, the Bury Your Dead tour of Quebec City, but <laughs> Bury Your Dead in Quebec City. <laughs> <laughs> so... Uh, I, I, I don't suppose uh, Michael is wearing a gamache scent. He is not. now, actually. Are you yeah, wearing? I'll go and smell my Are you wearing the gamache one. scent, Michael? No. 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 But you are, aren't you? All right. My, my, my yeah, brother just, Doug is, yeah, is here as well. So that we can all come by. Yeah, you have head. to stand up, please, Doug. <laughs> there. <laughs> smell that man. <laughs> There. I finally get back at him for years of torment growing up. <laughs> well, now, I'm, you know, I, I'm sure that there are people out there who have questions they want to ask, and there is a microphone for you right over there. So uh, why don't you just line up or raise your hands or uh, stand or whatever you wish to do. And the, the only thing I would ask is, because the books are so intertwined now, all the story lines and development is um, to try to be a kind of thoughtful about the questions and not spoil a book for someone who hasn't gotten this far, uh, if you don't mind. No, no, yes. Or no. Margaret and her shoes will be after you. No, 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 uh, 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 don't give away any plots, and that's from book one on up. So I think, you know, it's probably only safe if you shower me with compliments. <laughs> I, I don't think that's working, is it? Stand up and yell. Oh. <laughs> you can yell. Uh, sure you but, can. But you know what we'll do is we will repeat the question, then if you can yell, but we're going to do this woman first. Yeah. I don't Who do know. you read? Who do I read? Yes. Who do I read? That's a wonderful question. Um, uh, I don't read anyone contemporary. And not out of choice, I wish I could. It's because of two reasons. One is that I'm afraid of being influenced by my contemporaries. The other thing is that I read almost exclusively for relaxation, um, to shut my mind off. And I find now if I read crime novels, um, a part of me is thinking all the time, how did they do that? Oh, that's fascinating, that's interesting, or I don't like that, why don't I, or this didn't work. So I'm, part of me is always analyzing. Um, and I don't want to do that. Having said that, I have some friends who, uh, whose novels I do read, and they've, because they've sent them to me, and uh, people like Lisa Scottolini, I think, is brilliant. Um, Reese Bowen is wonderful, uh, Deborah Crombie. Um, but I generally read uh, Georges Simenon, still the old, you know, the, the Josephine Tays. I go back and, and reread some of the old uh, ones. Read a wonderful book recently, nonfiction. Read a lot of nonfiction now, um, called The End of Your Life Book Club. Oh, that's a great book. Just, and he's so nice, the man who wrote it, just genuine. Actually, there's only one question because you actually touched on it before, and that's when you become very successful, do you begin to lose control of, of your product, of your stories, either because of a publisher or um, a movie producer or TV network or something like that? But the, the other part is, in a recent trip to Boston, to Barnes & Noble, <clears throat> there at the checkout counter next to the cash register are the three highlighted books for the month with three of my favorite mystery writers, uh, Patricia Cornwell, Kathy Reichs, and Louise Penny. Ah. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you for telling me that. Uh, and and I, that's a very good question about whether I lose control. Um, so far, I've been very lucky, and I haven't. But I think I'm very lucky in my publishers and my editor, who is this. She's been an editor for 40 years in New York, and she's just a fabulous, fabulous champion of the series. And she gets it. She understands what the books are and gives me the freedom to do it. The only da danger of losing control is, again, my own fear of starting to write a, a, a book that I think you'll like. I mean, it sounds silly, because of course I want you to like it. But I need to really write a book that is appropriate to the characters and to the series. Um, so the only control I could lose is lose control of my own ego, more than anything. <laughs> yes. Hello, Louise. I met you for the very first time at the Toronto Book Show when you were introducing Still Life. Oh, wow. And I've been a fan ever since. Oh, bless you. And you were kind enough to give us your card, and you read for us at La Maison Anglais in Quebec City. <laughs> Are you from Quebec City? My son's bookstore. Oh. Yeah. oh, no, Guy? Peter, so he says oh, hi. Peter. Oh, good. Oh, <laughs> wonderful. Thank you. Peter told me I had to come tonight and say hi. <laughs> <laughs> Your new one. But the one thing I do want to say is that the one thing that carries through in all your books that are absolutely fascinating, and we, everybody has to read them, but it's the quality of life that you carry through the whole thing. Thank you. And they're Thank just you. wonderful. Thank Keep you. it up. <laughs> Thank you. That's so kind. Say hi to Peter for me. And, and La Maison Anglaise is a great, great bookstore. One of, the, one of the terrific independent bookstores and an English bookstore in Quebec City. So it lets you know how good. <laughs> Hi, thank you very much for coming tonight. Thank um, you. My family is French-Canadian from the Eastern Townships, and I was curious what, if you know what your French-Canadian readership is. Um, well, of course, a lot of uh, the, the Quebecois are, are bilingual, of course, so a lot of them read the English, the original English version. Um, but my books were translated in a, about 23 languages before they were translated into French. <laughs> I know. I couldn't understand it either. <laughs> I, I, I mean, you could get them in Estonian before you could get them in <laughs> Quebec. And it was, it was kind of painful for me because they really are love letters to this province. I'm an Anglo. I was born and raised here. In, 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 I went to Lawrence Park Collegiate. I, I was born and raised, for the most part, in Toronto. But I found my home in Quebec unexpectedly. I didn't expect to feel so at home there, and I did. It was like like they were saving a chair for me. And, and when I arrived, I sat down and, and, and felt completely chez moi. Um, so I, I really want to reflect that, my love and my gratitude for the place. And it, it hurt, hurt me that my neighbors and friends couldn't read the books. But then finally, now they are coming out. Flammarion Quebec has translated them. They're also available now in France uh, by another publisher, but they're using, thank God, we insisted, the Quebec translation. So they're in <laughs> Quebecois in, in France, which is quite unusual, but it was very important for us. Um, so I think they, they, they hit the bestseller list. They get well-reviewed. Um, they've been very, um, I don't want to say kind, because it, that makes it sound patronizing. I think, I think they appreciate or understand that that this is a different point of view. My point of view is also different. It's not an English Quebec point of view. It's not an Anglophone point of view, because an, 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 an Anglo born and raised in Quebec sees it very differently than I do. I see it, I am one step back, so I see all that's happening in Quebec, and it doesn't touch me as deeply emotionally as it does with people who were born and raised there. Um, but uh, they've been, they've been um, accepted and embraced, and I am very, very grateful for that. Having said that, so far, I don't think anyone in the Sûreté de Québec has read a book. <laughs> <laughs> so. I, don't ha I don't have any family with them, so that's okay. <laughs> Oh, good. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, Louise. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Um, and also, thank you for sharing uh, every day on Facebook. It's uh, it's marvelous and a pleasure. Sort of vicariously saw um, London with you this summer. <laughs> so <The> visit garden. <laughs> the visit garden. Um, my question is about the character Gamache. Um, I think I've 
read somewhere or heard somewhere that you sort of got inspiration from your husband, Michael. Mm -hmm. But I'm wondering if uh, there's part of yourself, maybe your relatives or your friends, you know, recognize um, parts of your soul in, oh. in Gamash as well. I would hope so. That's a beautiful thing to say. Thank you. I, I hope so. I think of Gamash as, you know, in, in Abraham Lincoln's second inaugural address, he talked about the better angels of our nature. And I genuinely think of Gamash as the better angel of my nature. That, and, and Robert Service wrote uh, a poem, um, gosh, I've forgotten what the name of it was, but it was where he took a prostitute and he painted her as the Virgin Mary. And the line was, uh, he painted her as if the worst had been the best. Isn't that beautiful? So I sort of think, think that he's like, if, if, if I want to be cynical, and find fault, Gamash would be a decent human being. So he is as, as though my worst was the best. Um, so I, I hope. It's, it's quite a challenge to write a man who is both smarter and nicer than I am. <laughs> it's very humbling. It is really quite humbling. <laughs> but he does. He's, it, it sounds silly to feel inspired by, because I think there are qualities. It, he, he is aspirational for me. He is the person. I don't think, I, I, he's a man, obviously. I don't know why, as an Anglophone woman, I write a Francophone man. I think therapy is in order. <laughs> um, but I, I, what I am when I'm writing is writing just a human being, and he is the human being I hope to become. That's a perfect segue to my question, Louise. I, um, I find Armand such a complex and human character, and I thank you so much for bringing him into our lives. And I remember my heart just breaking for him in Bury Your Dead. I'll never forget weeping at the end of that book. It was just so moving. But I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about his humanity and his frailty and his need for forgiveness at times. Mm -hmm. um, these are such compelling ideas and some of the, the ways that you've shown us his vulnerability. I wonder if you can speak to that a little bit. Uh, yes, I, I, I'll, I'll try. I'll, um <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she talked about the, the you talked about forgiveness and the need to forgive and and you know I think people who aren't familiar with the series and just hear sort of broad strokes about Gamash being a good man can mistake him for being um, a perfect man and he's not he he just is a good man who is trying his best and he understands that to, to do what he has to do in life, he cannot, and neither can I, carry the burden of resentment, can't carry the burden of anger, um, can't carry the burden of jealousy with him because it won't allow him to achieve what he needs to achieve. Um, and so that's, that's the struggle, is letting go of things that, um, that are very difficult to let go of. And he's, he, he feels very strongly about trying to save lost souls as well, the people, the refuse, the people who are thrown away, trying to, trying to help them. He's, in many ways, he's, he is inspired by Michael, who um, was the chief of hematology at the Montreal Children's Hospital, which was really the worst job in the world. He's the doctor you never, ever, ever want to meet. And Michael, you used to wear bow ties, not wearing them tonight, but... <laughs> Uh, that had balloons and teddy bears and things on them so that when he leaned over dying children, that's what they would see. And, and he would hold their hands into the night and he would tell young parents things no young parent should ever have to hear. And yet, every day when he came home, he was and still is the most joyous man I have ever met. Not because that gave him pleasure, but because he understood and understands still the gift that life is. And that's what Gamash has. Gamash understands what a gift life is and what a betrayal of those young lives it would be if those of us who brush gray from our hair don't live it with joy, with gratitude, and the courage it takes to be kind. How much more courage it takes to be kind than to gr draw a gun and, and pistol whip someone or shoot them or, or bully them or be mean or, or have character assassination or all those things that we can all do but it's not, it's so, it's facile. It takes no character to find fault. 
takes a lot more courage to, to encourage someone. And that's, that's what Gamash knows and tries to do. So I, I a long answer though. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Louise, this is such a thrill for me, and I'm sure everybody in the room, <laughs> to be here. I, I thank you so much for being you and creating what you have created, which brings us all such joy. I have read every book in order, because I do <laughs> like to read things in order. I have found each one um, progressively more compelling, and I have fallen more in love with Gamash, and I have become more interested in, uh, in the characters, and in Three Pines. The latest book I finished three days after it came out. Nothing else got done in my house because <laughs> I couldn't put that down. My question is regarding The Beautiful Mystery, which was the only book set not in Three Pines. And I will confess to momentary disappointments where as, as I got into the book and realized that perhaps this wasn't going to be Three Pines. Mm -hmm. Where's Clara? Where's Peter? Where's the bistro? Of course, it was so compelling that I, I thought you had just given them a vacation and uh, put Gamash to work in a very, very different environment. Why did you, did you change the setting for that, for that uh, book? Thank you for that question. That was, I realized after the third book, my in, in, initial intention was to set every book in Three Pines, um, but I realized that that really would, would beggar belief um, that the small village could sustain the murder rate. And, <laughs> and it was becoming increasingly difficult to describe it as idyllic when... <laughs> So I decided that every second book after the, after the third book would be set primarily somewhere away. So the fourth book was set in the country inn. But there were scenes back in Three Pines, Three Pines, A Barrier Dead, primarily in Quebec City, but scenes back in Three Pines. I understood eventually it would be necessary to, to, to take Gamash completely away. And that was a risk. And that's what I tried to do is, as to keep my own interest in the series and also to become a better writer, I need to keep risking and trying and, and sometimes failing. And that was certainly a risk and not everybody appreciated it, but I really wanted to set, to, to follow him somewhere else. Um, and I chose the, the monastery because there are a lot of monasteries in Quebec. And I loved, again, that duality, the idea of these cloistered monks who had taken a vow of silence becoming world famous for their voices. Yes. And uh, so I, and, and the power of music and the love of music and, and, uh, and how that also can feed into addiction. Um, so thank you, I'm, I'm glad that you enjoyed it. Oh, I did and thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, it's one, oops, <laughs> it's, I should take this out. It's wonderful to hear you in person. Um, it's really a thrill. Um, I thought I'd have a rather utilitarian question, but it sounds like it's not as simple as I thought it would be. So I'm trying to choose one, perhaps this is better. I'm trying to choose one of your novels for a book club. And because it's mostly a series, we thought maybe start with Still Life, but um, I think the novels really get more and more wonderful as they go along. Um, and do you think that Bury Your Dead would work or would it be really a, a shame? A starting to point? Yeah. I mean, you know, most, mo many of the people have already read, but I don't that's think That's a very interesting, has. that's a really, really interesting question because normally I would say start at the beginning. How, however, having said that, I do know that if you start, let's say, with Bury Your Dead, which has an interesting setting and also a little bit of Three Pines, then people can go back mm -hmm. and read if they're interested enough and catch up. I think it is a book. Each of the books is meant to be self-standing because it's not fair if someone comes to this book, picks it up, never having read the whole series, and then they feel completely lost and then they get frustrated. So um, I, I, I don't know, what do you think? Do you think Bury Your Dead is, would no. be a decent? I, uh, that's the one, uh, in fact, that's the one I would choose if I were the, doing a book club. Yeah, the it would thing be very. So, so Margaret sorry. said very dead, but someone over Thank here you. said I no. With yeah. The, 
and then went back. Good. The thing, the thing that I think is most uh, really moving about Bury Your Dead is the, the portrayal of Gamache as not the strong, silent, no, wonderful I, leader, but, but shattered. Shattered and having yeah. to rebuild himself in this quest. Yes. Yes, I would, I, I would, I would start. And, and if it doesn't work, you blame Margaret. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. I'll need that. And besides, a lot of people saw the movie. And anyway, I won't go Thank there. You. <laughs> Thank you. Hello. Hi. Never have I reread a novel, let alone a whole series. So kudos to you on that, because I've never reread anything. And never have I yelled at a novel before. <laughs> I was so angry. And oh, then when I reread, no, that's okay. as far as I'm going. Good, and thanks. then when I reread it, I yelled again at the same place. <laughs> it sounds like at the beginning when you began writing Still Life that it, you were maybe hoping for a one-hit wonder. And yet all of these tie together so intricately that I'm wondering, did you have the whole, well, these, this, thus far, the nine novels in your head in some way tied together and then built them or fleshed them out as you went along? Or are they all completely separate? No, the, I didn't have them all tied. To, I, I must admit, when I started Still Life and even the second book, I didn't know the trajectory of, I knew I wanted the characters to evolve, but I wasn't sure how. And there was a certain kind of organic um, part of the process. But when I was planning the fifth book, which is um, The Brutal Telling, not writing, but planning it, I knew how this book would end. By then, I knew the trajectory, and so everything was sort of rushing toward actually the penultimate um, chapter I noticed, I noticed a number of the titles of books to come being noted very clearly, at least in my mind, in the early books. Oh. And that's why I wondered how they, if oh, you yes, had it I all tied together. Or... Yeah, I see what you mean. Like, Bury Your Dead was a, was a, a quote from an earlier yeah. book, and um, um, this, uh, How the Light Gets In, which is from a Ken, uh, Leonard Cohen poem which turned into a song anthem was used in the second book as well. So yes, there, there are threads that were sort of things that were seeded early on that I went back and it's all sort of tied up in this. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just to mention, we, we've got, I think, four people there and we're going to have to cut off the questions after them. But you four, don't worry. <laughs> Next. <laughs> Now that we've talked about the trajectory of the series, I've been wondering what, what germs of other things are starting to percolate. Ah. Sometimes people want to write spin-offs. Oh, tell us more about this character or that character. <laughs> What's, what kinds of things are starting to just percolate, percolate in there? Nothing. I have one good idea a year, and I'm... <laughs> I'm writing it for all it's worth. It's, it's halfway through <laughs> September already. I'm serious. I don't know how people write two or three books or even short stories in a year. I, I get one and I just, you know, feed off of it. So no, I have no other ideas. I'm, it's a good question and one that my agent sometimes asks. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not Teresa, is it? <laughs> um, but no, I don't, I don't actually have other, other things. Do you know, because I find writing these honestly so satisfying. I like the company, I like, and it allows me to explore all sorts of issues that I, that I find interesting. So thank you for the question, but so far nothing. My first question is, may I please have your necklace? <laughs> <laughs> this would only be better if it was edible. Would that be great? I know, it makes you I think of it as my Wilma Flintstone yeah. necklace. It, it, you definitely want to put it in your mouth. And, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, there is uh, uh, one of the Nordic mystery writers, I read so many mysteries that I don't remember, that she did a very interesting book where she imagined um, one of her characters actually jumping the queue because he demanded that his story be told before, you know, the motherless woman. Did it. And so the whole book is about this character and the writer struggling, who's going to tell the story. A battle of wills. So, I mean, we, we kind of touched on this with the trajectory of the series, but I was wondering that when you're working with your characters, how much, um, they're so clearly delineate, uh, delineated as personalities, how, how much of those characters 
did they get to run away sometimes and do things that you're like, oh my God, I can't believe Ruth did that. Or, you know, <laughs> what in the hell did Gabby just say? Yeah. Or, or do you keep a very tight rein because of the deadline, which I would think would be kind of, you know, you really kind of have to hold on to that and not let the characters have too much head. You know, you just, you just, you just did the, the, exactly, the struggle is at least what I struggle with and, and it's imperfect is how much has to be figured out and structured beforehand and how much, but if I do too much of that, then there is no room for inspiration. Right. So I have to allow it to breathe, but not so much that it falls apart. So it's always that kind of trying to reach that balance as I'm writing. And I think that's where the, genuinely, the great grace of what the therapist said of allowing my creative spirit to write the first draft. Because in that, I really, I have an idea, I know what the story is, I know what the plot, I know why it's happened, I know the main, themes I want to explore, and then I just, I just let, let it all happen and just see what, how we get to the end. And then I start to shape and shape and simplify, simplify, simplify. Um, so for the most part, I know the main thrusts, but I really let, let's say, Ruth and the duck. That wasn't planned. I didn't see, <laughs> I mean, who could plan such a thing? It was going to be a goose or a... Yeah, well, yeah, it could have been. <laughs> yes. Okay, thank you very thank much. You. Hi, um, she, actually asked the, she actually asked the question that I was going to ask um, just around character development and whether any of the characters have ever done anything that surprised you, but that kind of, you know, answered that. But I also just wanted to comment on how much I have appreciated what I've learned from your books. I've read them also a couple of times through, and I remember the first time I'd, you know, read them slowly, but then I'd get to a certain point where I'd want to, you know, find out, so I'd race through it oh but oh. the second time well yes but the oh. second the second time i read them the second time i there was all these nuances that i had missed through through that you know and all these conversations and so from that you know i just want to say how much i appreciated I learned from those books, you know, in terms of something Gamache would say or do or an interaction and think, wow, I want to be like that or wow, I, you know, so I just want to say how much I appreciate oh, that. Oh, that, that means a lot to me. Thank you. I really, that's very generous of you. Thank you for saying that. Thank you. Uh, Brutal Telling does work as a book club book because uh, one of our members of our book club hates mysteries. And when I presented a br Brutal Telling, she actually came in and said, I love that book. <laughs> but I, my question is about the movie. Yes. Um, nobody's asked a question, and... I thought we'd get it through tonight without the... You were the, the last person. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. But I love the setting. I thought it really seemed the way I envisioned it. Um, I loved the way they did the story. They developed the story. I was really disappointed that, that the partner of Gamache was not French Canadian, and that a, he he had no French Canadian accent, and in the books he comes across as being very leery of Anglo's anyway, and I just felt <laughs> we have so many good French Canadian actors, yeah, I and agree. even why was Gamache British? Like I know he went to England, I know he studied there, but he was back in Quebec. He would have had his French accent back again. So I just wondered how you felt about it. Um, you know, I've, I've actually taken a step back from, from the film and from the whole uh, production of it. Uh, what I can say is that the process was excruciating. And I'd said no to all the offers for years, and I, but I really felt, and I felt strongly that a Canadian production company should do it. So I finally felt that I found one that understood the soul, not just the, the words, but the soul of the, uh, of the books and, and agreed to it. Um, I, it, it was a very, very upsetting and difficult process. Um, just be, you know, I think it is for any writer, and I don't think I was quite prepared for how the translation, how much that would be painful. Um, in terms of Gamash, I was actually involved in that casting, and I actually quite, it, it, Nathaniel Parker, on, on the first day of filming, came up to me, um, such a handsome man. <laughs> 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 when I regained consciousness, <laughs> he said that uh, he knew that 
he wasn't my image of Gamache. And, and I thought that was very courageous of him to face it head on and, and we talked about it and I agreed. He, he's not my image of Gamache, but he said, you know, I, I understand that, I appreciate that, but I think I understand who the man is inside and I think I can bring those elements to the screen and that's what I'm going to try to do. Um, and, and I, you know, I'm, I, I was satisfied with what, what he did. Having said that, I completely understand your, your concerns about it and you know, I agree. We have, Quebec has an amazing film community and, and, and does some of the best films, if not the best films in Canada, in Quebec. Actors, directors, everybody. Um, I, you know, I think, I think there were some decisions made there that, you know, but I also hope, as you said, you know, still life, I hope was good as a book, but I hope the series improved as, as I got better and better. And I'm, I'm hoping the same will be true of the films, that it will be a learning process, that they will take notes from it. And, and each, if there are new, book, new films made, each will improve. But thank you, I appreciate what you I said. I guess the thing is we feel we own it. No, I, <laughs> like we all have our interpretation. Yes, right? yes. But thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. And thank you all, and thank you, Margaret Cannon. Oh, my fantastic. pleasure. Thank you so much.